Hello everyone, welcome back to Variant Quran. I'm Daniel Brubaker. Thank you so much for watching these videos. I'm very happy to tell you today that we're going to be having a great interview with Dr. Mark Dury. But before we get into that, I just want to let you know that there is a new channel called Kindness and Truth. So please do go over and, and um, check that out, like it, subscribe, and so forth. It's uh, still at the very beginning, so there are only a few subscribers so far. Unlike this channel, thank you very much for being here. And the second thing I want to do is to say thank you again to all of you, uh, those people who have taken the initiative to contribute financially. I just want to let you know how much I appreciate the fact that you've done that. Uh, it's really what helps me to, to do this, and uh, I, I don't want you to think that I'm ungrateful. It really has helped me a lot. All right, so that is number two. And uh, the third thing is, of course, an update on what I've been up to. I've been up to a lot as, as usual. Life seems to be getting busier. In fact, I'm at a point in life where I could really benefit from having um, uh, some uh, administrative help to that end. Hopefully, we will uh, get that at some point. But the corrections in early Quran manuscripts has just been uh, completed actually in three additional languages. And so those are being typeset. I will tell you what they are as they get ready to be published. One of them in particular has some typesetting uh, challenges to it but the other two are, are pretty much complete and we're just waiting for the uh, publishing opportunities and, and the final details of that. So that's good news. I published a couple of other books. I am working toward this year the completion of my academic book, my proper academic book, as well as the um, response to Dr. Alta Kulich, which uh, I'm sorry, it should be out by now, but um, you know, all these things are going on at once and uh, life is getting very, very busy. So that is coming, as is the big proper uh, presentation of my thesis. So uh, that's uh, that's it. What else do I need to tell you about? Of course, we have had this past year. Some of you may know, and I made a, a video up actually on my other channel announcing it, but I ran for political office this year in Loudoun County, Virginia, and um, I, I sort of gracefully stepped aside from that when I didn't get one of the uh, important endorsements. I got a lot of really great endorsements from uh, significant people and could have continued on, but I did not want to divide the vote among, shall we say, friendly friendly parties and uh, risk throwing the election. So that's my first foray into politics. I was well received. I've, I believe, built a lot of uh, goodwill among people locally and a certain amount of respect among uh, among folks. In fact, I've been asked several times now to run for a couple of different higher offices, including the United States Congress. And um, I, I, I don't believe that my future lies in politics, but it has been an interesting thing. I learned a whole lot this year uh, doing that. And I do believe that these things are very important, so I, I don't take them lightly. That's why I went and decided to run in the first place. All right. So I don't want to take too much time with this introduction, but I know it's been a little while, so I wanted to give you that update. And now let us transition over to uh, the interview with Dr. Mark Dury. Please don't forget to check out the Kindness and Truth channel. You'll see the link at the bottom. I have as our guest, Mark Dury, uh, all the way from uh, Melbourne, Australia. I believe that's where you are today, Mark. Is that correct? Um, actually, I'm in sunny New South Wales. Yeah, oh, used right. to be in Melbourne. Mm. Right. Okay. Well, welcome, uh, Mark. And we are going to be discussing some really important things today. We uh, have both recognized, and of course, much of the world has recognized that uh, there are some very big things going on in the world. And these big things, as usual, are being driven by ideas and worldviews. So we want to talk about some of those things today. If you are joining us for the first time, please do take a, a, the opportunity to like this channel and subscribe. And uh, Mark, welcome. Mark, Good to uh, be with you, Dan. Uh, Mark, go ahead. And uh, I want to just introduce you to this, uh, a friend of mine and also the author of this wonderful book called The Third Choice. And we may have occasion to be discussing some of the material from this uh, in the next few minutes, but I want to recommend that book, and I'll also link that at the bottom to everyone. It's a really, really an outstanding treatment of uh, some of the things that we will talk about relating to uh, Islam, what it means to live in Islamic societies throughout history, what are the ideas and the presuppositions that guide that. Uh, but Mark, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you have been doing, and what you're doing right now. Yeah, so I'm a um, an Anglican minister and served in churches for 21 years in Melbourne, 
Um, and before that, I was an academic in linguistics. I, I, uh, my PhD at the time was on the language of Aceh in Indonesia, which is a very, which is the most Islamicized ethnic group in Indonesia. So I learned a lot about Islam many years ago when doing that. And then while I was still in parish ministry, I, I developed a, an interest in learning more about Islam and equipping the church for that. Um, so I've been working on that now on Islam for more than 20 years, did a second doctorate on the theology of the Quran. Um, and I've also been involved in discipling Muslim background believers. And that's something I'm, I'm really interested in. These days, we've moved away from Melbourne and we, um, we live in New South Wales. And I, I write and teach, basically. I, I, I speak at conferences and um, and write on diff from different perspectives on Islam. I'm interested in religious persecution, freedom of speech, um, discipleship, uh, also helping people to understand Islam. It's a very different worldview, and, and some of the differences are quite deep. Um, I've often been inspired by Wittgenstein's uh, comment, uh, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, when he said that we sometimes think we're tracing the shape of reality, but we're just tracing the shape of the frame through which we're looking. So mm. I'm really interested in helping people to, to to be aware of the frame and to question mm. it and maybe look at things in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's a good exercise for anybody to uh, undertake, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, Mark, I, I think it will quickly become evident, uh, if it has not already, that um, you are no lightweight when it comes to the things that we're talking about, and uh, you are a you are a solid academic and uh, very well qualified in in these areas. And I think I want to begin by um, just asking you this question, to which I do know the answer, but uh, I think it's always good to sort of set out on a discussion like this with um, an open acknowledgement. But uh, um, do you uh, do you like Muslim people? I really like Muslim people, and I spent a long time living among them in in their homes, and um, uh, have have formed deep friendships with Muslim people over the years. Yeah, so I mean, it's easy enough to say from a theological perspective. Yes, you know, all Christians are supposed to love everybody, but I actually, really do enjoy Muslim mm -hmm. people and have enjoyed interacting with them over the years. My experience living in Aceh, even though it's famous for its radical take on Islam and the history of jihad, I mean, my experience was overwhelmingly positive in many ways, and uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, living in that context. So I particularly enjoyed, in a way, in that time, a freedom to talk about faith, uh, which Western people are often quite nervous about anything to do with God. It feels sort of a bit intrusive to talk about that and but Muslim people are very, very happy to talk about their faith mm -hmm. normally. And so I really enjoyed that. Yeah, and I think the uh, the way that that unfolds, I've, I've also found that to be the case, and it's been a, a pleasant surprise. And the way and uh, the way that that takes place and the uh, freedom to um, have a very open uh, conversation is different, maybe in some different contexts and cultural contexts and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the reason I lead out, as you know, um, with that question is that often people who are critical of Islam and the and the some of the ideas and the theolo theological points of Islam are criticized as uh, with uh, terms such as uh, Islamophobia or Islamophobe or or is not liking uh, not liking Muslims and just want to differentiate those things. And it is important because ideas affect um, people's lives, and uh, you know that's why we have these discussions. We've been watching this play out in one of the first topics that I want to be well I guess we'll I guess we'll come around to that uh in in a more directly to talk about what happened on October 7th but um but the larger question that I wanted to talk about today is this uh, matter of uh, diversity and so in our cultures I believe both the Australian uh, culture and American culture and what we might just call western culture generally um, there has been, uh, in in recent decades, this very strong emphasis on something uh, that goes under the name of diversity. And it's this diversity is the idea that all ideas should be uh, equally embraced and celebrated and uh, endorsed. And um, I, I believe it sort of is, um, I, maybe you can correct me if you have a different way of putting this, but a... Um, sort of a sloppy um, 
development or, or understanding of the Western liberal tradition in the what we sometimes call classical liberal tradition of just uh, having an open uh, ability to um, have freedom to speak and freedom of conscience and so forth. And from this comes the idea of the the celebration of all different ideas. But those the one does not necessarily lead to the other, does it? No. Um, I, well, I th for me, a really key point was Jesus' insistence of his followers that they should love their enemies. And if you unpack that, um, I don't think it's just about enemies. It's It implies that there's a difference between um, whether you want good for somebody and whether you agree with them. So yeah. that you could disagree with someone and even think they'd really be harmful, that, that their ideas are very harmful. Um but that doesn't mean you detest them or want bad things to happen to them. It means, for example, in the European intellectual tradition, you can disagree profoundly with somebody and not wish to feel like punching them in the face, you know, mm -hmm. that you can have a, a respectful conversation between people who have fundamentally different and conflicting worldviews. Um, I think that's a Christian legacy. Um and there's also, I think, part of the Christian legacy is respect for vulnerability, respect for um, those who are in a weak position. Uh, and that also informs our understanding of the purpose of, of public discourse, that its its purpose is not to, uh, or discourse in general, its purpose is not to destroy or to get the upper hand, but it's, it's to uh, understand, to disagree well. Um, I think, by the way, that distinction between identity and ideas, you know, that you could you can attack someone's ideas or disagree, I'd say, without, you know, without attacking the person. That's that's a Western Christian um, kind of perspective that's not shared by all cultures. So um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've had Muslims say to my face, if you if you say bad things about Islam, you are personally attacking me, you know, you, that this is there is no possibility of disagreeing basically at a certain level mm -hmm. um there's a sort of mandated respect and and you see that in in this this is a trend in our culture as well in the in western cultures that it's not enough to just accept somebody you actually have to respect their ideas you know yeah. you have to honor their beliefs and and that's um um that's really i think that's really problematic because um uh, not all beliefs are equally worthy of of respect i think and some ideas are quite damaging and dangerous. So, it, it, yeah, it's the loss of ability to discriminate about the quality of ideas is uh, is a big is a big concern in our culture. In such an environment as the one you just described, that is one in which um, people's uh, ideas are, uh, you have to almost walk on eggshells in order to um, uh, avoid harming somebody's sense of identity. What, what sort of ideas tend to um, gain an advantage uh, in that sort of environment in contrast to a more free and open uh, discourse environment? I think there has developed in the West a kind of um, view that um, certain beliefs are not acceptable to be expressed. And it one of the contexts in which that happened has been a particular, a sort of Marxist view, I think, that the mm -hmm. world is divided into victims and oppressors. Yeah. And the oppressors are the powerful ones with the money and the and the access, and the victims are those in a, in a vulnerable and minority position. And we've developed a kind of hierarchy of victimhoods where certain types of identities are vi inherently victimised identities mm -hmm. that we have to compensate for yeah. in all sorts of ways. And other identities are oppressor identities and this 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 way of thinking of people instead of thinking of people as individuals who have a right to choose and uh, to speak for themselves uh, you have a situation where um certain people are deplatformed or excluded mm -hmm. silenced as people say so um and i think there's 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 obviously certain gender and sexual identities have been marked as um, vulnerable and oppressed. Uh, certain religious identities are considered to be oppressed in inherently. They're victim identities. Um, I think that's been the case for is for Muslims in some Western countries. So there's been an extraordinary amount of sensitivity training for police mm -hmm. in Australia and and Britain as well around um, around Muslim identities, and and that's affected the way policing is is managed. 
Um, and I think Christians are, have, in the way the West has trended, Christians have been often identified as uh, oppressor, uh, belonging to an oppressive class, uh, blame for all sorts of things in the world, and and then they can be treated really badly, lose their jobs, um, uh, silenced, um, treated as if they're dangerous, their views are dangerous. Um, I mean, in Victoria, in the state where I lived for many years, it's now illegal for a pastor to pray with someone who's unsure about their sexual identity. Wow. Um, wow. You, you know, if you go to your pastor and say, I have these desires and I don't know quite what to do about it, uh, will you pray, will you help me? And you, if the pastor prays with the person, that's illegal in Victoria. So right. um, yeah. I don't think that's intended to target Muslims particularly, mm. uh, but I think it's very much focused on on Christians. So yeah, so yeah, there's a vulnerability that's uh, for for Christians and Christianity in the West because of the way these hierarchies of victims of victimhood have been structured. Yes, and that. Uh narrative draws on the dominance of Western civilization and the history of imperial powers of the past couple hundred years. Are Muslims generally a victim? I think there's a few different angles you can take looking at that. Firstly, I think overall Muslims are doing badly in many countries. Yeah. Um, and where Muslims live side by side with Christians and, and the Muslims are not dominant, they're often um, they're often struggling, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bosnians are poorer than Serbians, you know. The like um, human development indices are lower for, say, Muslims in in parts of India rather than Hindus. Um, so Muslims, Islamic countries, apart from oil uh, income, uh, they tend to do badly economically. Um, I think Bernard Lewis once said that the whole of the GDP of the Middle East, apart from oil and, of course, excluding Israel, is less than Finland's. So mm -hmm. um, there are very few economic success stories in Islamic countries. So Muslims are, are doing badly apart, apart from oil revenues. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't make them victims, but it does mean their situation, their lot is difficult. And most of the the, the refugees that are flooding into Europe are coming from Muslim environments um, and they're Muslims. So that's because their their lot is difficult. So that's one perspective. It's it's tough in many countries to be a Muslim. Um, secondly, a different perspective altogether is that um, the reality is that where Christians live and non-Muslims non live uh, in, a, in a context where Muslims are dominant, there is persecution of non-Muslims. So I have an 80-80 rule that of the of the 50 worst countries for the persecution of Christians, 80% of them are Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. And of the of the Islamic countries in the world, 80% um, of them are in the worst 50 countries for persecution of Christians. So um, Islam uh, tends to suppress and treat as inferior uh, when Muslims are in power, they tend to treat non-Muslims as inferior. They give many, many examples of that. The third point, the third perspective. So the first one is, yes, Muslims are not doing all that well, apart from, mm -hmm. you know, special considerations. Secondly, when Christians and other non-Muslims are living alongside Muslims and the Muslims are in political control, there's often persecution, discrimination, and it's actually non-Muslims that are in the inferior position. But the third thing is that, um, and this is quite a profound point, is that Islam itself, the, the origin story of Islam is a story of the victimhood of Muslims and their response to that victimhood. So whenever you talk about the concept of victimhood in Islam, you, you have to come up against uh, the, 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 the origin story, the context in which Islam arose. It's actually Christianity, this is also true, the concept, concept of what is a victim or what is someone persecuted is deeply shaped for Christians by the life of Christ, his, his, his um, torture and crucifixion and resurrection from the dead. And his teaching about persecution and victimhood is absolutely central in shaping the Christian story and Western culture. That's and right. in the same way, Muhammad's victimhood and the victimhood of the early Muslims becomes a kind of template uh, which which projects itself on 
on Islamic self-awareness. And I think that's extraordinarily influential in the world and one of the least understood aspects of Islam today. Yeah. To the extent that Muslims are victims, you've done a good job of pointing out that um, not doing well uh, in the world generally is not necessarily a mark of being victimized. It could be the result of other factors, of course. But to the extent that there is a victimization or a victim status for uh, Muslims in the world, who is the victimizer or or what is the uh, vic victimizer? Are there factors, is the assumption that, uh, that Christians or Western culture or anything else is uh, doing the victimizing, uh, is that a fair uh, assumption or are there other things we should be thinking about? Yeah, there is a tendency, I think, to blame outsiders for Muslim disadvantage or suffering. However, some of the worst casualties, Muslim casualties, I mean, the uh, warfare conflicts where lots of Muslims have been killed, some of the worst examples of that have been Muslim on Muslim violence. Think of the Iran-Iraq war. Also, a lot of the conflicts in Iraq and Syria you, you you can think of many other examples as well. So the, con the the war between what became Bangladesh and Pakistan. So the Muslims have suffered a lot. And even today, there's, you know, Shiites bombing Sunni mosques and vice versa in, in places like Pakistan. So, yeah, so there's a lot of, lot of trauma is, uh, on Muslims is caused by Muslims. At the same time, there's a, there is a tendency to blame outsiders for that. There's a tendency to blame the Jews in a kind of global conspiracy mindset. Uh, America is blamed. I mean, seven hundred thousand people died. I think in that in the conflicts in Iraq and Syria. Did America's intervention in Iraq contribute to that? Yes, it did. Did they do all the killing? No. A lot of the killing was done by groups like ISIS. And so, yeah, it's um. Yeah, Muslims suffer uh, particularly from other Muslims in, 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 in large proportion. So I think it's a mistake to blame external factors. In fact, I think it's one of the most debilitating things about the Muslim world is that um, outsiders are blamed. Like it's it's the Jews' fault or it's the, it's the Christians' fault, the Crusaders' fault or the Americans' fault uh, that we're suffering. And, and it disempowers Muslims, actually. It takes away their agency, Right. It does. It does yeah. take away the agency. Yeah, yeah. And and it's it's a it's something that doesn't grab the attention of the West that Muslims are, are damaging the lives of Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's it's you don't see thousands of protesters in the streets when you know you didn't see that when Iraq was was fighting Iran. You didn't have that hundred thousand protesters in London about um, huge slaughter being taken. Uh, we, yeah. We're not really interested in in Muslim on Muslim violence. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a thing theme that we see tragically, I think, played out across the whole victim victimizer victimized narrative that seems to be a, a tool of the other great totalitarian ideology in the world, uh, Marxism, which we I think is something that we should talk about, but and that we may talk about tangentially and when we come around to the uh, situation in Israel. In terms of the relative success, the United States, for example, uh, in a very short period of several hundred years from the founding of the New World, uh, as it was called, and so forth, and the, and the founding of the United States and the various principles and so forth, became a, a, a huge success story very quickly, economically, and in many other ways uh, in the world. And other countries have done very well. Um, and when you take these as an aggregate and and compare them to, as, as you mentioned, the uh, economic situation across Islamic countries, do ideas have anything uh, to do with the reasons for success or, or the actual, uh, the fact of success at a societal level in these economic and other ways? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the culture, the culture makes a huge contribution. I think that's the difference between, say, the Islamic world and the East Asian world is, is, is due to the influence of sort of Confucian culture versus Islamic culture. Uh, South Korea went from one of the poorest and most devastated nations in the world to one of the wealthiest in a matter of decades. Um, Japan it also... take long, does it? it yeah. Well, they were they worked very, very hard, I can tell you that. No, but I mean, uh, given given certain uh, conditions, and I mean, you're not always talking periods of hundreds of years. It can be a, a generation or two uh, to a, a vast change in a society, yes. right? Yeah. And Japan was completely devastated, bombed with atomic bombs and humiliated its whole kind of warrior culture destroyed. 
And then remarkably, uh, America assisted it and it was able to rebuild and has been another incredible success story. China's gone from being very basic economy to um, leading the world in many, many areas. There's no Islamic country that, that's done anything like that. So, And I think ideas are really important. Um, the Chinese back in the late 80s, early 90s, did a study of America and they asked what made America great. And Chinese scholars came to the view that Christianity uh, created the conditions Mm. Um, one one of the things that Christianity does is it builds trust between people. Um, it and that it does that, yeah. for example, yeah. through insisting on telling the truth that people mm -hmm. should tell the truth. If you're living in a culture where lying is a, is respected and part of the culture, yeah, you can't trust people, and you have to employ lots of people to look out after people to check that they're not cheating you all the time. Yeah. and and corruption is a result of. Um, in, in a nation is a result of cultural settings that shape the way individuals speak. I mean, some people would say that, uh, oh, it's just poverty or, or lack of access to resources that causes corruption. I don't think so. Wealthy people can be corrupt too. Yeah, sure. I mean, wealth doesn't necessarily make you uncorrupt, uh, uncorruptible. So yeah, ideas are, ideas matter. They, they shape us more than we realize. They're more important than we realize. Yeah, I think the truth telling that is a very, uh, very important point. I hope people will keep that in mind. When it comes to now the question of can Western democracy survive Islam? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> Bernard Lewis, I'm, it's, it's going to take a while to give you this yeah, answer. That's... Bernard Lewis once said that Europe will become majority Muslim before the end of this century, before 2100. Mm -hmm. What will that look like? Well, let's assume that's that's going to happen. Um, and some countries, obviously, not all at the same time. So you might have yeah. a few countries that still have non-Muslim majorities and others, perhaps like France, perhaps the UK, that have Muslim majorities. What will happen? How will the countries change? Will the values that have created prosperous, innovative, and reasonably tolerant societies endure? Or will there be a fundamental change in the culture? Will Europe begin to look more like Saudi Arabia, for example, or Syria, mm -hmm. or Libya? And you could mention many, or Sudan. Will it be, begin to look more like that? Or will um, that, that demographic shift be accompanied by a shift in the values of the immigrant communities and their descendants? Will they buy into the European project? Will they say, yes, we want the values of, of Western Europe? Uh, to be ours, or the US for that matter, or, or Australia, or any country. Yeah. My view is that Islam is a powerful ideology and that it is transformative over generations. And that at the present time, the power of Islam, particularly revivalist Islam, sort of awakened Islam, yeah. the power of Islam to transform the worldview of young people is greater than the power of Western secularism. Western secularism is somewhat empty and uh, it creates a void in people and it's its values are drawn on the values of they're, they're based on the values of christianity but without those foundations um so in if if we keep going the way we've been going um that certainly there'll be country western countries that will become islamicized and they'll become they'll look more like sharia states much more than they do today. And Western worldview won't survive. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, let me give you an example of a fundamental value that shaped the West. Tom Holland in his book, Dominion, and he's not a Christian, by the way, a historian of oh, the classical know. world. Yeah. He argues that um, many of the key ideas and principles that have made the West great, or Western countries successful, um, have been drawn from Christianity. And one of those key ideas, which is based on the narrative of the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection, is that it's better to be, uh, it's more honourable and, and morally better to be persecuted than to be a persecutor. And he points out this is completely alien to the Roman world. In the Roman world, it was better to be a citizen than to be a, a, a crucified slave. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was no, there was no question about that. It was better to be a victorious Roman than one of the million or so Celts that Caesar killed when he when he pacified uh, Gaul. 
Um, so the, the Christianity caused a shift in that. It, 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 it caused a, a different way of thinking about vulnerability and uh, it, it, it treated honor not as a matter of power and, and dominance, but as a matter of uh, grace and truth, as, as the gospel writers say about Jesus. He was full of grace and truth. Now, out in the West, the valuing of minorities, the valuing, um, the, the support of diversity, this is actually based upon this idea, um, the, the valuing of someone who is in a vulnerable position, a weak position, above someone who is abusing them. Because normally in, in societies around the world, power is might. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not that's not the message of Jesus. Now, in Islam, there's a very different, very different take on the issue of persecution. Um, there's a there's a word in Arabic, fitna, which means trial or testing, uh, can mean civil disorder. It it sort of means things that cause Muslims to lose their faith as well. And the Quran says a couple of times, um, that fitna is worse than killing. That is, persecution of Muslims is worse than slaughter. Mm -hmm. And it also says twice, uh, fight them, kill them, actually, until there's no more fitna. So this is actually based in the story of Muhammad. He was he and his followers were persecuted in Mecca. Then they went to Medina, where he got military force, and he came back to attack and to conquer and to dominate those who had formerly mocked and persecuted him. And he said to his followers, persecution, that is of us, is worse than killing them. Mm -hmm. And th this worldview actually says uh, that, that, that non-Islam as a threat to Muslims, undermining Muslims, weakening them, if you like, is worse than killing. And also it, it, it promoted the victimhood of Muslims uh, as somehow something that, that validated violence. And you actually see what's happened on October the 7th as an example of that, where mm -hmm. uh, horrendous, uh, appalling abuse of human beings took place. Women were raped until their pelvises broke or their legs, leg bones broke. Um, horrible things happened. Um, parents and children being tortured in front of each other. Um, extraordinary abuse. Um, but there are people in the West that say things like, as one protester said in Melbourne, um, uh, decolonization is messy. That is, uh, right. no matter what Hamas did uh, in killing people, it's not as bad as their experience of persecution. That is, um, whatever it is that the Gazans suffer under so-called occupation by, by Israel, um, that is worse than killing non-Muslims. And so the victimhood of, of those Jews becomes discounted. And so that's a worldview in which the dominant Islamic, the mm -hmm. examined dominance is given a kind of moral permission to kill and to, to damage um, those that in a way stand in its way. Um, it means that, 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 that those that are opposed to Islam can never be given the status of victims because the greater victimhood of Muslims via, uh, justifies the, the violence of jihad. And in a way, the violence that Muhammad perpetrated against those who opposed him is like a wound in the soul of Islam. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fundamental kind of reality in the founding story of Islam. And it's a moral uh, offense in a way, that violence. And the way Islam manages that violence is by saying, ah, but we were the victims. Mm. We are, it's, our victimhood is is so great that it justifies the jihad. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that view then percolates down today. And you'll see sometimes, I mean, one of the most illustrative examples of this was when Wafa Sultan was debating with an Algerian Islamic professor and she was explaining bad things that Muslims have done to others. And he suddenly gets this incendiary rage that comes over him. Mm. And he starts shouting at her on Al Jazeera TV. And he says, we are the victims. We are the victims. Your victims number in the hundreds, you know, or the, maybe the thousands at most. Ours are in the millions. Mm. And building a society based on the greater victimhood of Muslims is very destructive. It's not, it's not going to bring peace. Diversity will 
be managed in a very cruel way. Like Islam's fine with diversity as long as um, mm -hmm. the best people are in charge and the best people are, are the followers of Allah, you know, those that are following Muhammad and his teaching. As the Quran says, you're the best people that have been raised up for humanity. You command what's right and you forbid what's wrong. So the pressure of the kind of Islamization of Europe will create a culture in which, yes, Islam manages diversity, but it manages by by putting kind of second class citizen status around anything that doesn't, yeah. um, anything that doesn't conform to, to the form of Islam that that the, that the state is promoting. Also, in Islam, one of the key functions of the state in an Islamic worldview is to promote Islam. It's to impose Islam. Mm -hmm. um, Islam doesn't have a separation between uh, religion and politics. It 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 treats them as combined. So once you have an Islamic state or a country or a, or a, a political system in which um, Islamized Muslims, if you like, are, are running the country, they will rule for Islam, and they will also discriminate against all sorts of diversity. Um, they this is this is Islam's policy for Christians and Jews is that they become vimis, they become second class citizens who's not citizens actually, but they're sort of tributaries whose whose life is and and way of life is permitted to exist, but under very debilitating and controlling conditions. So yes, the shift to Islam, Islamic majorities or Muslim majorities in Europe, for example, if if Bernard Lewis is right, will be accompanied by a complete overturning of the the moral categories and uh, ethical categories that have shaped European and Western culture, and one of the categories that will go is the idea that there's kind of honor or or, or value in in suffering mm -hmm. um, for for the truth. Instead, yeah. um, there will be honor in suffering for Islam, and any other kind of suffering will be will be marginalized. I'll just give you one one more example to, yeah. to illustrate this in in. In um, in Egypt, from time to time, there are massacres of Copts mm -hmm. uh, done by radicalized Muslims, and it's quite common after those incidents for Christians to be arrested. Like the state might arrest a few mm -hmm. Muslims, but it'll arrest some Christians as well. Why do they do that? Why is that happening? Even even though they're the ones that have been attacked. Well, I think it's to 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 say. Um, it's not the case that Christians are victims and Muslims are perpetrators. There are, there are Christians doing bad things as well. It's a way of kind of insisting on the script Equalize. that um, Muslims are victims. So even though Christians have been killed, Muslims are somehow victims, and we'll prove that by arresting some Christians and charging them. Mm. Uh, and that happens again and again and again. It's a psychological demand that the justice system, in a way, is corrupted by. And we are seeing that increasingly in the West, that, that sort of way of thinking. Yeah. Um, another example, um, I heard a really moving testimony from a young British woman who was one of the girls who'd been trafficked in, in the rape gangs in, in the UK. And mm. most of those have been, most of the perpetrators, but not all have been Muslim men. And her testimony was that she was, as she was being abused, um, she was being abused for two reasons. One is that she was white, and the other is that she was a Christian. Mm. And that was that was made very clear to her by her abusers. In the end, the family moved to another part of the country. The police, interestingly, couldn't help her. They said, we cannot help you, even yeah. though she went multiple times to the police and brought wow. um, medical evidence, uh, doctor's reports. The, the family moved to another part of the country, changed their names, and she went on to get a medical degree. And, um, and a very impressive person. But what was really interesting is that the police had had so much sensitivity training around the the victimhood status of Muslims and their vulnerability as a community and the result, the reality of Islamophobia and so on, that they were very they were really disabled from intervening in these horrific abusive in, uh, abusive cases in which there was abundant evidence and her suffering. Uh, was not allowed to drive the the policing response. That was not permitted, and that's an example, I think, of a of a seduction and corruption of of a of a society. And it happens in many many small increments over a long period of time, and then one day you wake up and you say, "Oh, everything's changed," 
so yes, I think it's um, there are tough times ahead. And one of the good things about Tom Holland's book is that he he crystallizes, I think for secular readers as well, some of the core values of the Western of the Western tradition and explaining that it, that they come from Christianity. One of the things I'm concerned about is that, that a, the decline of Christianity in the West, not in the rest yeah. of the world, but in the West, is leading to a situation where that input, um, the spiritual input, is is declining. And you'll gradually see a breakdown. You'll see a breakdown between the separation of the different powers in Western democracies. You'll see a breakdown in the separation between politics and and mm. the public service and, and, and the courts. Um, th these sorts of the systems that we've set up with the separation of powers in the West are based on Christian perspectives of the human person. Mm -hmm. And as those perspectives go, uh, then those structures will, will begin to break down. I mean, just to give you just to explain that point a little bit more um mm -hmm. one of the the western christian principles uh well sorry sorry one of the key principles of christianity is that people although made in the image of god and therefore in some sense glorious are also sinful and therefore yeah. uh, they are a threat mm -hmm. <laughs> people are a threat everyone you know as as solzhenitsyn famously said that the, the line between good and evil runs down every heart yeah. every human heart the middle of every human heart now, an implication of this is that when you set up political systems, you set up balances, mm -hmm. checks and balances, because you don't try and give all power to one person or to right. one body. If you did, they'd be corrupted. So sin would multiply. So you set up um, somewhat juxtaposed powers. So the police are not meant to be just instruments of politicians, and the courts are independent of the politicians. And you also have in the in the in the I know in the Westminster tradition, the public service are meant to be independent of political parties and so on as well. Um, now that, those separations are based on a view of the human person, an anthropological view, a view of what it means to be human. When that view goes, when people reject the idea of sin, those separations will will break down inevitably. There's Islam no, has no a, reason for them anymore. In the public, you don't need them. Understanding. People yeah. are basically good. Yeah, people are basically good, and all they need is a bit of education and a bit right. of training. Yeah. Um, Islam actually has a different view. It says people are easily led astray, and what you need is a state to guide people. And yeah. guidance is not a gentle walking alongside thing in Islam. It's a you will do this. <laughs> It's right. a command um, or punishment uh, construct. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, the Western secular view that people are basically good and all they need is a bit of education to allow them to realize themselves, it, it sort of aligns in some yeah. ways with the Islamic view that, well, that the state's role is to guide and to direct. And in some ways, um, the worldview of human values that Islam has brought in is kind of meshing with the Western secularism. And that's um, that's troubling in the long term yeah. so yeah sorry it's a long answer but yes we have really troubling and difficult times ahead and it's not obvious to me that western democracy western democratic open tolerant societies will survive and that's and i think a main reason is the biggest challenge to that in the long term is uh, is the growth of islam are uh, taking advantage of the of the vacuum that that secularism is creating in the heart of our cultures. Yeah, when you talk about limitude, and you've written, and we're going to put flash up your book here on the screen again uh, as well. Excellent, excellent book. Everybody should uh, pick that up and read it. Um, but I notice uh, I notice it happening all around the um, the movement toward uh, even in in the United States where Sharia is not uh, officially in place and it's not, you know, legally required or anything like that. But there's this uh, compliance with Sharia starts to creep in. And um, one of the uh, examples that was given by uh, somebody who's a mutual friend of you and I, I, I would imagine, um, just a couple months ago, he was saying he uh, he's from a Muslim background. He uh, has the, the the look. If he cares to dress as a Muslim, he can, he, he can appear as one. At the time, he had a big beard. He went in to, buy, uh, to apply for a building permit, and uh, he was rejected. Um, no matter how hard he tried to reason with the uh, bureaucrat, he could not get his permit. And he went home, and he came back uh, a couple of days later dressed in full Muslim garb and went to the same administrator with the same issue, the same application, and every single request of his was approved instantly. And he chastised this guy who apparently didn't recognize that it was the same person standing in front of him, or maybe, I don't know why or why not, but he said, you know, you 
bent the rules when I looked like I was a Muslim. Why? And I, I think this double standard, this treatment, this ex expectation that uh, that Muslims actually somehow need to be treated differently for whatever reason, or uh, you know, even if that reason is is fear of being accused of um, of uh, being one of the victimizers, uh, playing and plays into that narrative that you're talking about of uh, Muslims always being being the victims. And so they've, this is I see it. All these little things happening around us are evidences of a training that's going on where everybody is being trained to um, behave, uh, even when the law does not require it according to Islam's rules and norms for the way society should operate. And so, since we've been talking for for a while, I did want to turn just very quickly to the um, topic of uh, Israel. Do we still have a couple more moments to talk about that, or shall sure. we? Okay. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the whole colonizer, colonized uh, narrative, um, we see things often framed uh, as as an occupying uh, power. And I, I think in the Western mindset, this is something that is sort of nobody wants to be accused of, of being a colonizer or being an occupier. But clearly, when it comes down to it, we're talking in religious dimensions. We're talking about Islam. We're not when we're talking about Palestinians. You're not talking about um, necessarily the indigenous peoples of the land, because Palestinians, up until the formation of Israel, meant uh, Muslims, Jews, Zoroastrians, Christians, whoever was living in that land were called Palestinians. However, today, when we talk about Palestinians, we are usually talking about and understanding it to be uh, a situation of uh, in which Islamic territory, territory that was understood to be uh, Islamic, has been... Um, uh, encroached by a by a country that is odious to Islam, and so have I got that correct? That that is uh, that is really the issue is that it's a non-Muslim power that uh, is the problem in the view of the surrounding nations. Well, certainly, if you read Hamas's charter, that's the issue. They they say that once land has been conquered for Islam, it, it's a it's a heritage of it's a legacy of for the Islamic world forever. It can never be never be taken back. So that's that's their view. I think at the at a deeper level, the Islamic kind of consciousness or awareness is is shaped by this idea that it's Islam that conquers. It's never conquered. Yeah. Um, it's Islam that uh, it, it, these conquests, Islamic conquests, are referred to as openings or liberations. Yeah. Um, and and and. and to to establish a state, a Jewish state in particular, in the very heart of the Muslim world. And in, including um, the the temple in Jerusalem and the and the Islamic sites there, this is deeply disturbing. It's sort of symbol of everything that's gone wrong for the Muslim world over the last five hundred years, where they've been pushed back on many fronts, militarily and culturally. Um, it's a sort of a lightning rod for Islamic dissatisfaction mm -hmm. um, and frustrations. Um, so yeah, I think it is the, the, in a very deep sense. It's a religious. It's a religious objection. And Islam, as I said, uh, is okay with diversity as long as the diversity is managed by Muslims. In fact, it prides itself on, on allowing diversity. And so the the objections back in the 30s that the, that the uh, Arab Muslims were making was not that there were Jews in the land, but that they were threatening to become a majority. They, they would therefore be in a position to rule Mm -hmm. um and they that is unacceptable and it, it that's not going to easily change that kind of fundamental view that this should belong to us one of the british observers at the time said even when it's put to the muslims that having more jews in the area brings wealth and and economic development and more opportunities mm. they still say we'd rather be poor you yeah know, than being ruled by jews and that's um that is what it is i think Despite that, I think it's possible to have coexistence. That is, it's possible for for some Muslims to become accustomed to this reality that you've got a Jewish state there. Um, but it, well, but it's there are not many easy. Muslims that live in Israel and are doing just fine. Uh, yes, I, I think they relative. feel yeah. they feel awkward. They're kind of marginalized. Yeah. They know that yeah. that that Israel is is a self determination project for the Jews. But they have freedom, and uh, in many respects, they have much more religious freedom than probably Christians would have under Hamas, for example. Yeah, um, and they're flourishing. Yeah, and Christians are flourishing in Israel too. That's the only country I think in the Middle East where 
the the, the proportion of Christians or the numbers of Christians are growing. In, in most other countries in the Middle East, Christians are sort of constantly leaving. So yeah, the fundamental objection is religious, and it's 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 then keyed into a whole lot of religious scripts as well. That is the idea that once land has been occupied, there's this principle in Islam that once Muslim land has been occupied by non-Muslims, it's an individual obligation on every Muslim to go for jihad. It's no longer an obligation of the state. It's a it's an individual duty, and th this this is a constant driver of. Um, resistance as they call it resistance movements yeah having said all that i there's also something intensely pragmatic about islam the challenge for israel is to constantly maintain military uh, technological uh, cultural supremacy so that they can hold their ground in the face of um surrounding threats because uh, if if at any point um the the surrounding nations or the palestinians gained kind of civilizational competence to the extent that they had well-trained armies and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, significant industrial capacity, uh, there would be threats to Israel. So they have to, they have to kind of rule from strength. And, uh, and also the other thing to realize is that the Muslim world is itself divided. So Hamas is basically feared and detested by the Saudis, for example, yeah. because the Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood are uh, devoted to overthrowing uh, countries, Saudi. governments <laughs> like the Saudis. Yeah. And so um, the Saudis would have no problem in killing Hamas operatives. Yes. Uh, and they, and to some extent, they, they'd sort of be relieved if they didn't have to do it, and then the Israelis can do it. Yeah. Um, and they, the, they, they know the Muslim world knows that there, these Muslims realize that there are these conflicts that they themselves suffer from and there's opportun political opportunities there for Israel but yeah it's fundamentally a religious issue and also the victimhood of the Gazans for example is is a religious issue because it triggers it triggers this this script you know a yes. fitna is worse than killing so it yeah. says oh if, if people are causing Muslims to suffer then anything we do in response even 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 murder is is not as bad and and so that that is pushing governments like Egypt, who are opposed to Hamas and regard Hamas as their enemy, really. And the Muslim Brotherhood is, you know, they they cruelly destroyed the Muslim Brotherhood as much as they could in Egypt, taking over from them. That that means that you know the Egyptian government is not pro Hamas by any means, but as long as there are Muslim victims, as long as Muslims are dying, they have to be in a sense pro Palestinian. Yeah. And, so they're they're in an awkward in an awkward situation too. Well, and this yeah. is probably what drives the uh, the holding up of the dead uh, baby up or or the or the doll of the baby, whatever it is, on the to the camera. Uh, you know, of course, the death and wounding of innocent people is always lamentable. It's interesting, but, but that really plays into that. Uh, that it's it's almost like a call. Look, this is come help us. You now have an obligation to uh, be on our side. I think that's exactly what's it's it's a it's a script in a way that um, speaks to Islam's fundamental yeah. understanding of the value of the human person. It's interesting to reflect on why what's happening in other conflict zones, like the Ukrainians showing you know bloody babies every time a hospital is bombed or a clinic mm -hmm. is bombed, and mm -hmm. are they are they using the same tactics? Is the left or the hard left? partnering with Ukrainians protesting around the world whenever these things happen. No, they're not. And it's interesting, too, when when there's been Muslim on Muslim violence, for example, I think 80,000 Yemeni children starved to death in the recent conflicts. Oh, um, these, the, the, these, these images were not taken mm. to the streets of Melbourne or Sydney or Right. Or, or London in, in massive yeah. protest against who? Whether it would be protest against Muslims, then right. that, that wouldn't work, you know. Mm. It, it's 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 the fact that this is this Jewish state causing, uh, apparently, you know, in the way of thinking is causing this harm. I yeah. mean, in my view, it's Hamas that's fully responsible for all right. the violence. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, so I think that the theological grid empowers and shapes the social media it 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 shapes the psychological response of people and actually i think that 
in some ways, um, part of the West has bought into this view of the, of the greater victimhood of Muslims. And that, for me, explains why, you know, feminists in the West have not been up in arms in large numbers over what what, what happened to mm -hmm. uh, Israeli women, young women. It's absolutely appalling. Um, the, the, the Hamas... Uh, operatives were jihadis were told to go and abuse women oh yeah um and they were commanded to do it and it was a, it was a religious and military obligation as it were <laughs> being put upon them yeah and um and that that is not evoking the sympathy it should and i think the reason is that you have this script that fit knows worse than killing and it's Just worse for, yeah yeah it's worse for a hospital to be bombed in Gaza, even if it is a command center for Hamas, yeah. than it is for um, anything at all to be done to Jewish people. Um, and yeah. this is a yeah, it's a, it's we have a civilizational struggle on our hands in Australia and in in America and in London and across Europe, and it runs very deep. I think many people at the moment are shocked by the the turn that things have taken. Um, they couldn't have imagined that we've ended up where we are. I was speaking to a Jewish friend in Melbourne, and I mean, Jews in Australia are terrified. Really, they 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 can't believe mm -hmm. where we've where we've ended up. But if 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 what I'm saying is right, and the place that we're in now has been shaped by uh, Islamic self awareness, Islamic understanding of victimhood and of violence, then. Um, we're in the early stage of his stages of Islamization, not the latter stages. And there's more, mm. there's more to come. The question is, will we read the times? Will we understand some of the processes? It, can I say also, it's very difficult because um, the West has denied for many years the importance of religion as a as a shaping factor in our culture. Very, very concerning uh, and frustrating. Mark said it was the opiate of the masses, which is basically saying it's sort of irrelevant. It's just a drug. Yeah. It's a distraction. So we we've de-skilled ourselves uh, in, in from being able to understand how religion shapes our world, and also because we've um, we've kind of bought into this victimhood worldview, to criticise a religious belief is somehow seen as a as a as an attack on people's identities and their very beings, and so there's a powerful sensorious kind of um, uh, impulse in the West to, to stop discussion of, of religious difference. And that's um, that's also weakening us. Now, I think historians will look back on this time and they'll say to a significant degree, we've done this to ourselves. We've, mm -hmm. we've done things in our culture, in our classrooms, in our homes, in our politics, in our newspapers, in our entertainment. We've done these things that are making us very, very vulnerable. And we in the West, I think, yeah, hard times ahead. Absolutely. I believe that they will say that. And I think that they will be right. I wanted to just, um, I recently heard you say something that I think is uh, relevant here and maybe a good way to conclude. And that is uh, that when attacked, well, let me just frame it a little bit. I gave a talk three months ago. Um, assessing the progress of colonization, if we call it that, since 9-11. And the interesting thing is that post 9-11 in the United States, two thirds of the mosques that now exist in the United States were built post 9-11. The Muslim population in the United States um, doubled in a period of mere seven years after 2007. We have our first uh, Muslim elected representative in U.S. Congress post 9-11, and not only one, we now have four. We have all these things going on, and yet, so there was this initial pullback in horror from the um, events of 9-11, but that was followed fairly quickly by people who were formerly had no real interaction with Islam, who were the American, whatever, whatever they were, now going out and being almost active apologists for Islam. And you gave an analogy uh, that I heard recently about the fight and flight and that those not being the only two options. There's a third option. Would you talk about that for a second? Yeah, so we're familiar with the idea that a dog might flee or it might fight, but there's a third option when an animal's afraid and that is to tend and befriend, to come and lick the feet of the one that is threatening them. And I think that whenever you have like terrorism, one of the 
the purposes of the terrorism is to cause people to be terrorized, is to cause them to be afraid. And one of the responses to fear is to uh, seek to get on the in the good books of the person that's threatening you. So it's actually a very deep psychological response. It's not something that's self-conscious. Um, I suppose what people have called the Stockholm syndrome is could be an example of that. Sure. Um, and I think I think my feeling is that Christians that have lived under Islamic conditions have been conditioned often by these sorts of dynamics mm -hmm. to speak well of Islam and to speak well of uh, of the relationship as much as possible. And you'll certainly see examples of that. I I write about that in um, in the third choice. So I think we are. Uh, I think that explains the conversions to Islam after 9-11. You know, you might have thought, oh, if Islam is like that, it would turn people off Islam. But there was the wave of, of Western people becoming Muslims. Yeah. Um, I read a testimony of a man after the Beslan massacre. He heard the account of the Beslan massacre where jihadis killed Christians and he became a Muslim on the spot. Hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, you sort of, join the you join the party that's most convinced about their their likelihood of winning there's a certain um, element of that yes yeah so there's the, the yeah fear fear does condition us and shape us in deep ways that we are not we don't always understand i mean one of the things i want to say dan about this whole conversation which i find difficult in some ways because the last thing i would want to do was to cause people to be frightened and yeah. i think people Christian people, for example, should reach out to their Muslim neighbors and show right. them love and, and yeah. care and respect and kindness. And we we as a society need to insist on that and not misunderstand what I'm talking about. But I think one of our problems from a policy perspective is that those that are setting policy um, have no concept of the long-term mm -hmm. civilizational cultural shifts that are taking place. Yeah. Just a simple little example in Australia. We have come to accept polygamy in Australia as long as it's not registered with the state. And the whole point of registering marriages in England in the first place was to stop unregistered marriages. <laughs> that was the whole point of the state yeah. registering marriages at all. And that was done for the safety of women and children, basically. But what's happened in Australia is that um, the government's basically said to the Muslim community, well, you know, polygamy is okay as long as you don't register it which is the complete opposite of what they should have been saying. And it's a, a bad policy decision. Uh, it's bad for women, but it's an example of a kind of a step-by-step -step process of an Islamization of a culture and a, you know, and a change in our values. So, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's concerning. Um, but yeah, but my, my, my thing I really wanted to stress is um, nothing in what I've said should discourage people from reaching out in kindness and love and, and, yeah, uh, with a desire for life-giving uh, relationships with their Muslim neighbors and friends, and that's essential. We, we really need that in the years ahead. Well, and I I'm, I appreciate you bringing that up again. So we will uh, conclude just about where we started: uh, that we love Muslims, that you and I both, and we encourage our friends to to love everybody, and we make to make that distinction between the ideas, um, the theological assertions, and the people, and the people. Uh, are not the enemies. Uh, many, well, everybody is um, is victimized. If we were talking about victims, we're uh, ev to the extent that people are victim victimized, they are uh, victimized more than anything else. But, uh, wrong ideas that lead them in bad directions. So, anything you would add to that, or anything else in conclusion you'd like to say, Mark? It's been good talking with you, Dan. Uh, these are not easy things to talk about, and yeah. Uh... I think people all over the world are kind of struggling at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the Christians are wondering how to pray. Uh, they're trying to make sense of conflicting perspectives. They're wondering how how to find their way through it. And mm -hmm. I think we have to talk. We have to find ways of exploring these issues. So I do encourage people to read The Third Choice because I believe that book does explain the foundations in Islamic law and history for many of the dynamics that we are now seeing. Mm -hmm. played out in 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 Gaza and in our in the cultures uh, the cities of the of the west as well. Yeah. Yeah, again it's an excellent book and yeah, it's uh, as relevant today as ever. I was just uh, 
to throw one more thing in here, Mark, I was I was reading just in an old journal this morning from for some reason from 2005, and it was uh, I don't even remember exactly what was going on then in Israel, but it's a similar situation where they were fighting back about something, and and a, a ceasefire was was pressured upon them by probably by the United States and other uh, international forces, uh, much like has happened just now. And so, that to say, history. Uh, repeats itself. This book was written a certain number of years ago, and yet it is uh, dealing with things that uh, have been happening for a thousand years and more. And it is good to understand that because when we understand our world and the ideas that are shaping our world, we will better be able to navigate and to make good decisions for the benefit of ourselves and for our neighbors. Indeed. Thank you, Mark, for joining me. Yes, yes, thank you. And uh, again, thank you for watching this video. Um, we're glad to have you here. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, join us again. Thank you again, Mark. Thanks for having me.